we, we put out a call for people to send in stories. We could have spent all day listening and watching stories from all over the diocese like this and not told a hundredfold of the amazing work that is going on. I am grateful for all those who participated in those uh, videos. Their vulnerability and power bears witness to God's mission and its impact as we embrace it. We are a story diocese, an amazing diocese, filled with people who are miracles because they allow God to do work through them. You all, the people of the Diocese of Texas, are doing incredible work. Every week, we as bishops visit, uh, staff visits, and we see this work, and we come back to our different offices telling of the amazing things that you are doing. You might look at our annual report, which, which reveals all of this, uh, the uh, pastoral care, the ministry and community, the serving, the reaching out, the giving a hand up, where a diocese is doing transforming work in very real lives. I, I had a woman write me this week and tell, how great, tell me how grateful she was for our restoration of her home. And we couldn't even share half of it if we wanted to in the time that's given us. This is a collage of some of your stories shared this year in line with each other. You can read more in that annual report, the Texas Episcopalian. Uh, plus, uh, I want you to see that our giving is following uh, our vision for creating healthy communities, uh, health and not just health care. Uh, you'll see in this next slide a view of our transformational work over the past few years uh, with the Episcopal Health Foundation alone, giving out across our 57 counties. Uh, and I, I know that Elena will have her own presentation to update us uh, as we are reaching out and serving more than 2% of the people uh, in our counties through local outreach ministries, congregation by congregation, our institutional ministries like El Buen, Samaritano, St. Vincent's Lots, the Cathedral's Beacon, our funding with partner organizations, our work through Episcopal schools, the local partnerships between churches and public schools. We can definitely see that the Episcopal Diocese of Texas is having a positive impact on communities around us. We just heard from Joanne about our uh, church planting initiatives. Uh, so many good news. Uh, I uh, uh, can't believe that we have uh, five more planters working in the field, even now learning and listening to their neighbors and gathering worshiping communities like Carissa Baldwin in the north side, who are all beginning to lead us through greater church planting. The Reverend Bryn Bond and, and, and Incarnation in South Austin will be moving to public worship space soon. And Joseph, you t capitalizing on Mosaic's work and Oscar Huerta, uh, uh, Garcia and Waco. All of these are amazing stories of church planting and the impact that we're having. You all, the, we have not had this kind of scale of church planting in this diocese since the 1950s. And I don't believe that there is any diocese in the in the Episcopal Church right now achieving this kind of impact through church planting, mission, and missional communities. This is an amazing, amazing work. And I just hope that you all would give a round of applause to Joanne and her team, but also those church planters who dare to step out in faith uh, to do this work. As we look at our campus missions, it's hard to imagine that when we started we had uh, six, and now that we're up, uh, to 26 different campuses. Uh, there are 80 educational campuses across the diocese and we want to reach all of them. And in fact, we believe we can with your help. And so figuring out what campuses are near you, imagining who God's calling in your communities to go forward uh, to plant that church. I know that you'll talk to somebody like Jason Evans or others on the Mission Ant team uh, to do that work. Many years ago, I uh, invited you to consider missional communities. And uh, you all went, huh, what's that? Uh, but today we have 90 missional communities, small Christian churches, 
some of the most innovative, exciting, generative, and creative ministry that we have ever seen. The 44 congregations, 1,400 people who would not have normally walked through the doors of our Episcopal churches today find their weekly connection through a missional uh, community uh, and, and connection. You can download, we have a book you can download uh, and a study guide if you want to imagine how your congregation could embrace this work. You could attend our August 28th through 30th uh, Cultivate Conference, which will have 13 uh, hours of instruction from people who have found life, uh, a life-giving uh, exercise in doing this mission. Uh, the weekend will additionally serve as an orientation for those that are accepted into our one-year mission developer track at Iona. So we believe we don't only need to train uh, bivocational priests and deacons and lay people to serve, but we need to specifically train and prepare mission developers so that we can amplify and uh, grow uh, this work. We get a lot of concern sometimes about where, uh, how we support uh, our uh, existing congregations over and against uh, our new missions, and this gives you a 50,000 foot view of that. I know that Linda went around at pre-council and showed you a more in-depth study of how these dollars are spent, but uh, we really believe in supporting our existing congregations as well as our new plants with human resources as well as financial ones. Uh, we see that to, uh, bearing out as we look at our transitions, and uh, we um, uh, normally average about 100, so uh, dis uh, despite the sense that 73 feels like a lot of transitions, we were actually a little lower. Uh, we have a lot of work to st still to do uh, in the area of raising up uh, clergy uh, and uh, studying and working on vocations. We had a vocations task force which revealed kind of the nature of movement within our diocese and the health uh, and vitality of our clergy, the age of our clergy. What became clear is that our number of uh, women clergy, for instance, after rising uh, from 8% in my episcopate is, and reaching over 45% has dropped back a little bit to about 38% due to some retirements uh, and moves. Our other goal uh, for leadership to reflect the community in which we serve, uh, we still have a long uh, way to go. We've redeveloped our process towards ordination and are adapting the discovery retreat and uh, being curious about uh, perhaps having a generational uh, retreat uh, for people interested in ministry, perhaps in their 20s. Uh, we do think that we have a lot of work to do around formation between baptism and adult vocation uh, and uh, discernment. Uh, so this is occupying a lot of our time and how do we inspire vocations? We have all of this mission and service and evangelism going on and uh, we have to imagine how to raise up the baptized for this ministry. And you'll be able in our second volume of the journal to read a full report of that vocations task force. As for the numbers, uh, we have in training seven bivocational priests at Iona, 10 deacons, four people have engaged the lay track ministry, the ministry track. We have 15 in our seminary track. And in 2019, 64 people dis participated in a discovery weekend trying to imagine what God was calling and inviting them to do. To, since we started our discovery weekends, 241 people from the diocese have come to sit with others to pray and imagine what God is doing. Yeah, it's, it's an amazing, 241 people saying that God is talking to them and inviting them into something more in a sense that we're partnering with them. We have six people discerning uh, full orders right now, and they are supported in their local and regional discernment groups by 25 individuals who are gathering with them and praying with them and listening to their story and trying to uh, help them discern what God would have them uh, seek out. We have 11 applicants for seminary track this year to start in the fall, four Anglican study applicants. We have six deacons applying and seven bivocational priest applicants. This is massive growth in vocation over the last three years, and that is because we've begun to talk about it in our congregations and with our young people, and we want to keep up 
this conversation because this is about right. <laughs> we want to hum along with these large numbers because this is what it's going to take to maintain both our growth, our energy, and to deal with the coming retirements over the next year. Our goal is to raise up lay and ordained ministers of every type to serve in congregations and schools and hospitals in the world full-time and part-time and by Bible. Because we just want to imagine all the different ways that God wants to put us uh, to work. From birth to death, we are called, we believe God calls us. And that God is himself praying for missionaries to labor in God's field and that we are to join him in that prayer and in that work. And I know that some of you out there today are considering this even now. And we take that seriously. We want to pray with you and walk with you. I want to encourage you, if you haven't dared to speak to a priest yet, please do, uh, or to a senior warden. Let us partner with you uh, as you begin the walk of discernment for whatever God is calling you into. We have to dream dreams of God's call to us. Not just that we hear the voice, but we have to nurture those who hear that voice so that they can be raised up in such a capacity as to be able to say, here I am, send me. There is so much good work, there is no way to capture it all today. So we are in the process, we've done this a couple of times before, uh, I am in the process of engaging a 360 degree review uh, after 11 years of ministry with you. Uh, we're gonna do a deep dive of conversation uh, and report out what 200 leaders, your elected leaders and some appointed leaders believe how we're doing. And then we hope to be on the road uh, to visit with you. I will be coming with a few people to kind of unpack more what we see happening in the diocese and how we think we're doing and what we think our learning edges are. We're gonna do that the second and third week of June, and so I'll be visiting each one of the congregations and hoping to engage. Uh, last time we engaged over 2,000 people in this process. We hope to do that again. I think it gives us a real sense that at the end of that, it will help us direct our uh, team's work uh, on your behalf. Uh, so uh, we'll also have a time there uh, to, we'll be right on the edge of Lambeth. And so we'll have an opportunity to visit and talk a little bit about uh, that, uh, that process. So let me pivot a little bit here uh, to, uh, to three initiatives, three initiatives. The first is about minding the gap uh, during changing times. Over the last 16 years of working in your diocesan office and with you, I have tried in my various positions to relieve, uh, alleviate the increasing pressure financially on congregations, to steer dollars towards existing congregations and mission, best practices and vitality, and towards new congregational starts and emerging missional work. But in the midst of all of this, the truth is that we have continually trials and storms and hurricanes and fires and conflict. We, are, we have marshaled, I believe, the resources to meet those challenges in the past, and we're fortunate enough uh, to care for each other at such times so that we can hold ourselves together as we do that. And in 2019, we implemented, as Joanne talked to you about, the small maintenance grants, these kind of beautification and maintenance grants to help partner with you uh, in that work. One of the places where we are most vulnerable as congregations is when there is massive financial change. In smaller congregations, this is, uh, could be precipitated by a family or two leaving, just moving out of the city or town or neighborhood. Our most vulnerable congregations seem to be those between 100 and 300 average Sunday attendance. A local business closing, grad students hired away in a college town, taking whole families with them. Deployment of military families, or even conflict in the parish. Whatever the cause, and there are a variety of them, such loss of income can be a problem. 
That problem is amplified, unfortunately, by the assessment. The council, that is you, sets the assessment. Neither the executive board or I or even my team can change it. We actually have no power to do so. That's why when we start organizing for business, we have to ask permission to seat those who haven't paid their assessment. So I'm going to ask the executive board to look at two ways of helping our congregations and report back next year in some form of action. The first is to look at decreasing the lower end of the assessments altogether. Today, our assessment percentage is between six and 10%. We wanna to move to 5%. We can do that well because of the good stewardship of your dollars and our dollars. Uh, and uh, as you'll see in Linda's finance report, uh, we can easily uh, move uh, and lower our assessment at the bottom end uh, and do that without raising anybody else's assessment or moving, for instance, to an 11%. So we have the capacity to do that, and I think this is an easy thing, and it's a way in which we can really help uh, both those young congregations as they start, but also congregations who are going through a financial downturn. But then there is uh, the shoots and ladders of parish uh, finance. And so the second proposal uh, is to look at uh, special cases of congregational and financial decline. Right now, there is a one to 5% cap, depending on how you look at the assessment, and that only after the new year begins can anything be reset. What we wanna do is create a system by which the Executive Board Finance Committee might look at congregations that lose let's say 15% or more of their income in a year. This would be completely doable for us. And West Texas already has a model that we can use and build on for our own purposes. It is my sense that these two financial initiatives would continue to alleviate pressure. We would be able to act immediately in a financial downturn for a congregation to adjust an assessment. It wouldn't be up to me or the diocesan office, your elected officials uh, through the executive board would hold your power for you in that time period. But it'd give us a way and means of operating in between councils. Uh, on, on small congregations especially, such support can really mean uh, life and death and a struggle and gives us some room to pastorally be present with them. Be a nice add-in is to support already low assessments compared to the rest of the Episcopal Church, combined with other underwriting and grants, these two initiatives will give us some opportunities to help with immediate need, and along with our other new mission strategies. So that's the first initiative. The second initiative is what I wanna call unity and mission amidst divisive partisanship. I believe, uh, and I think you do too, uh, that we are living in an environment where there is very little dialogue, where we are divided across partisan lines. You don't have to do, it's not hard to see this by the way, all you had to do was read your Facebook post as you got ready to go to Thanksgiving and Christmas dinner with the rest of your family and how you would or would not talk about certain things. I've been listening to you, clergy and the lay people, uh, as you all struggle with this because it's invading our congregations. I hear from you that you can't talk to your family members or friends, you can't talk in your congregations. Uh, I know you have literally, some of you have literally walked away from decades old relationships because of this. Spouses are having a hard time talking to each other sometimes. and. And I think this is really one of the hardest things. We should even shut our clergy down for repeating the words of Jesus right out of the scripture because we suspect it's some, some plan of a partisan group to weave its way into our pulpit. Most of the time, I think uh, your good, hardworking preachers get it from both sides. Uh, they, your preachers, your, your clergy can't win. They're not liberal enough or they're too liberal. 
And it's rough to preach to you people to begin with. <laughs> I'm just grateful I get to do it once every couple of years, you know? But they get it every week. But let me be really clear. Partisan politics does not govern the unity of our church. <laughs> Jesus Christ governs our unity. The narrative of scripture where God is the prime actor governs our unity. Sacraments of baptism and Eucharist govern our unity, our common acceptance of God's mission, our unity in serving others and sharing the gospel. These are the things that unite us. We, because of our baptisms, are citizens, our collect says, citizens of a different kingdom, with a different Lord, with different virtues and different values. And as I listen, I'm always curious, who told us, who told us that we were too weak or too unsure that our footing wasn't solid enough to remain together as one church, even in the midst of partisan life? So we've put together some resources to this end. We believe we need to practice skills to help us to live together during divided times. And we are preparing a list of resources. And thanks to a generous gift from the Quinn Foundation of $500,000, we have a financial foundation so that congregations may take advantage of some excellent work that is out there to have healthy conversations to table would be a way of talking about it in the midst of a bitterly divided world. And to that end, we're providing a leadership training for our clergy with Brene Brown uh, for a Dare to Lead conference. And then we're hoping to add events and in-person opportunities, including but not limited to fierce conversations and better angels, beyond gated politics, an Episcopal civil discourse curriculum, a curriculum to go with the book uh, my new book on citizen and faithful discipleship, uh, and Baylor even has a public deliberation initiative, which is really excellent. So we're looking for other resources, and uh, even the ELCA's Golden Rule uh, and the Lambus Difference uh, course. So we're inviting uh, a broad piece, and we'll have those resources uh, for you and hope to be able to provide some grants and maybe some collective work where you could do work in your congregation or if you needed or wanted to do the work out in the world that you would be able to get some finances for that. Isaiah 58, which we read last night, comes to mind immediately uh, that if you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger and the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light, as uh, Bishop Ryan reminded, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continuously and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong and you shall be like a watered garden. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt and you shall rise up from the foundations of many generations. And you, you, you shall be called the repairer of the breach and the restorer of streets to live in. We are invited into God's narrative where God, where God is the primary character and where we, we may become a different kind of community than the community of the world. God's community, a different kingdom, a different Lord, and a different understanding about what it means to be kin and family together. The third initiative that I wanna talk with you about today, the final initiative, is about racial justice. I believe that we live in a time where our public discourse and conversation, or lack thereof, on race is actually really disappointing, disappointing to most of us. 
As I talk and visit and listen, I find that most people would like to continue to make strides forward. Most people want and desire a positive outcome on race. But we feel most often powerless and mired in other people's conversations, struggling to make sense of the past. And while we want a different future, one that resembles better the kingdom of God, we're not really sure how to get there or even where to start. I want us to make a renewed start on this. We're dreaming of this, we're, what we're dreaming about, and so doing mending, mending and repairing the past, walking into the future in new ways, supporting what is already happening on the one hand, and engaging in new creative ways on the other. Today, churches from Austin to Marshall, from Waco to Tyler, Houston to Matagorda, Big churches like Good Shepherd Austin, middle-sized churches like St. James Conroe, and small churches like St. Philip's Hearn, and everything in between are engaging and uh, understanding the nature of race and our story and what we might do in bringing justice into our communities. People are taking pilgrimages to lynching memorials the lynching memorial in Alabama. And there are conversations brought about as people table and visit together in their own community. Trinity Marshall's done amazing work and not just doing the work inside of the congregation, but then engaging the wider community and bringing together diverse peoples for a unified conversation that is hopeful and for the future. Or we might look at the work at St. Philip's Hearn that they have done, which has literally told and retold a story that has been in their midst forever, but not heard by the people. What we need to do as the Diocese of Texas is to capture the momentum of, of, of the work that you're already doing. Our positive, our hopeful belief that we can be a more diverse, more unified, more transformative church by leaning towards one another on this issue than away from one another. This will mean a continued effort to shift our understandings of racism and white supremacy and uh, how institutional racism affects us, but we will find our solid ground of mutual ministry and mission when we engage not partisan philosophies, but godly theologies. We must engage a solid doctrine of creation that God has made each of us and that God intends us to be in community together. We must have a robust soteriology, a theology of anthropology and sin that explains why it is we engage so easily and readily in sibling rivalry and scapegoating one another when it comes to conflict and fear and anxiety. And remember that we are a covenant people, that we are to undertake what we do in the framework of God's covenant with the people of Israel that is characterized by faithful compassion. That mixture for an internalized sense of identity and kinship and loyalty and obligation, responsibility for each other. The first and second commandment that we do, uh, that what we do draws us closer to God, first of all and always. And the second commandment that what we do draws us towards those neighbors, those people who we live with. That we understand that like the parable of the Samaritan, that when we see people in our community that they are hurting, that we actually have a sense of compassion that is faithful towards them and that we give ourselves and our own resources to assist in mending and repairing the wounds that they feel. In our community, we see this clearly in the bodies of the immigrant and the migrant worker, but we also must see this in the personhood of the black body, still wounded from years of inherited poverty 
and wounded from slavery. What we do today also on this prepares us for a diverse mission in perpetuity. We are one human race, and the gospel is for all people. As I look for guiding principles to help me understand the kinds of characteristics needed in such an initiative, I, I turn specifically to the work of Richard Salini from the founder of the Georgetown Memory Project. The first principle is that these efforts need to be voluntary, right? They need to be voluntary. And I hope that you'll discover as I roll each initiative out that I and others involved in the project and in this work have undertaken it willingly as an act of collective responsibility for our past and for our future, but also that we want to engage and continue that voluntary participation, inviting others to join with literally the hundreds of people in the Diocese of Texas across 40 congregations to do this work. The second value is proportionate that while we are just beginning, that the project that we are about to reveal to you has scope and duration, and it is attentive to original wrongs that I didn't have anything a part of but benefit from, but also that we imagine a hopeful future. That it's remedial, that our goal is to support people and communities, and that we actually want to be attentive to the injuries of the past. It should be equivalent. That means it's not just hugs, <laughs> but money and finances as part of, of uh, that may have been withheld or taken from communities in the past. It must be inclusive. That means developed in collaboration with injured parties. While I spent the last few years working on this project and visiting one-on-one -on -one with people, arriving at some 200 individuals, that have participated with me in imagining what we could do on racial justice together. I then invited 38 representatives of our historic black churches to meet with me and to begin to think about how we together may roll out this work in the year to come. They are committed to working with me and together we're going to create a process and board to oversee and help and promote the initiative. Coordinated designed to reinforce and amplify what we're already doing, the remedies adopted by others to learn best practices. And I've sought to undergird this work with the best theological principles and practical ideas in the present moment of our church. And finally, I wanna draw on Polly Murray and her quote uh, that I think it must, we must be focused on that deep theology of equality as God's people, a mutuality of a community that God invites us into, and a reciprocity where we understand that God wants us to share what we have. These principles affirm the richness of individual diversity, but also the value of community ties that bind each of us. Now, before we continue, I want to affirm some historic memory because I think sometimes as we look at the past and because we're the Diocese of Texas, we've done some really amazing things. But sometimes in the highlighting of those amazing things, we don't always tell the whole story. And so I want, I just want to tap into a few pieces. It is true that the Diocese of Texas and her bishops post-Civil War were lauded for early efforts to multiply black churches in the South. It is also true, though, that our first bishop was enabled to do his ministry because he himself owned household slaves. And it is true that our first church was erected by slaves and that it was paid for from the labor of slaves. It is true that we set about planting our historic black churches and even appointed a missionary dean to do so. This is really early on. But it's also true that our overall history shows fewer dollars 
given to the project of mission maintenance and ministry of those historic black churches and Afrocentric mission over the years. It is true that clergy and laity alike spoke out against slavery and racism and even courageously stopped lynchings in some of our communities, like Columbus. But it is also true that other leaders, including Bishop Gregg, defended slavery, white supremacy, and were silent. And we believe that some leaders in the 19th century and early 20th participated in lynching. They certainly were silent about it. It is true that we were early to desegregate our separate but equal camping facilities and schools. Bishop Hines and Richardson called us prophetically to a transformation on issues of racism early on in the South, both for our church but also took leadership in our cities. But I think it's also true, I know it's true, that we have at times used the notion of self-determination and freedom to shirk our mutual responsibility for one another's life. This is not a full telling of our history, the times that we fell short, nor of the times when our community stood tall against the powers and principalities. But naming those things without fear or anxiety helps us to understand the complexity of this issue in our own life and community. And I hope by telling you, you will see how each of the following announcements fits into the overall work that we can do and hope to do together to repair, heal, and imagine together and step into a different future for the Episcopal Diocese of Texas. Now, as we looked and had conversations with leaders, the first two racial justice gifts have been made to support current and ongoing projects. The first is a gift from the Episcopal Health Foundation. It is a commitment. Over the last few years, they have engaged with us in doing the work of racial justice through their congregational engagement arm, and they have pledged $1 million over the next 10 years to continue uh, that work, to continue to support our congregations as they do this work. Uh, They've already spent over $300,000 when you look at dollars uh, for the programs, but also in time and energy spent by uh, their team. The Episcopal Foundation has agreed to continue that funding for 10 years. So the first gift is a million dollar gift for continued work. The second gift is for the Reverend Pauli Murray Scholarship Fund at the Seminary of the Southwest. Both the Bishop Quinn Foundation and Church Corporation have given $500,000 each to further endow with a $1 million gift, the scholarship fund, which helps students of color pay for electricity bills and food and those basic needs around seminary attendance. We hope that these efforts, both of them will dovetail with other initiatives in order to continue our capacity building around racial justice. The next gift is the John and Joseph Talbot Fund for Racial Justice. Episcopal Foundation of Texas and the Episcopal Health Foundation have both committed $1 million each to the John and Joseph Talbot Fund. They were slaves owned by Matthew Talbot, who was one of the founding members of Christ Church Matagorda. In 2003, Evelyn Talbert, a, a, a descendant of the Talbots, visited Christ Church in Matagorda, and the Reverend Haas Gwen, who is the vicar there, uh, found her and understood that she was looking for her ancestors. These are two baptized slaves mentioned in our baptismal book, and she had returned there to give thanks for her own Christianity. Evelyn came to find where the gift of Jesus and the gospel had come from. She and Haas talked. They connected with the Talbot family who are still there. They had a meal and they worshiped together. And so the John and Joseph Talbot fund, uh, John and Joseph Talbot are examples 
of a very complex history and story. And the fund named after them will be held in the church corporation. It will help to educate internally uh, the goal of work of eventually working with the Equal Justice Initiative, the Lynching Memorial in Alabama, for pilgrimages uh, to support work like the Beloved Community or One Human Race, to enact local memorial pilgrimages to sites of lynchings in our own diocese, to bring churches and seminary students and community members together to hear and know our past story and to imagine a different future together. The grants will be given by the board that I mentioned a minute ago that will be created by Episcopalians of color from across the diocese representing the historic black churches. The next gift is the Henry Weta Wells Scholarship Fund. One million dollars has been given by the Bishop Quinn Foundation. Henrietta Wells was an Episcopal laywoman who attended St. John's Tyler, Texas during her time at Wiley College, where she was also a member of the great debate team, which there's been a movie made about it. She was baptized originally at St. Clement's Episcopal Church in Houston, which is now St. Luke's, and ended her life ministry at St. James, Houston. This, too, will be part of the church corporation funds, and annual gifts will be drawn from this endowment and used to provide scholarships for students attending historic black churches, colleges, historic black colleges and universities in the Diocese of Texas, Houston Tillotson, Prairie View, Texas College, Texas Southern, Wiley. The scholarships may be given to churches to work with students in those colleges who want to sing in the choir, assist in ministry, perhaps uh, because many of these schools are teaching universities, they might uh, engage in teaching internship scholarships at uh, local schools or Episcopal schools while continuing their education. The next gift is for the Reverend Thomas Kane Fund for Historic Black Churches. In perpetuity, 0.2% will be set aside annually from the Great Commission Foundation for the mission program and ma or maintenance for historic black churches of the Diocese of Texas. In 2020, the first grant is estimated to be made in the amount of $250,000. In 2021, that will increase to $275,000, and so on. The Reverend Thomas Kane was born into slavery in Petersburg, Virginia, and served at St. Augustine's in Galveston, planted churches in East and Central Texas, first priest of color in the Diocese of Texas, and even represented the Diocese of Texas at General Convention in 1886. He was made deacon and priested by Bishop Whittle, a fifth bishop of Virginia, that was in charge of St. Philip's Church for colored people in Re Richmond, Virginia, before coming here. He transferred to the diocese in 1888 and was placed in charge of St. Augustine's, a graduate of the first class of Bishop Payne Divinity School, now part of Virginia Seminary. Cain died in the great Galveston flood. Held in the church corporation overseen by new board, the program aims to grow capacity within existing black congregations. It may be spent every year or portions may be allowed to grow as the board sees fit. The program will not prevent those historic black congregations from participating in other programs and partnering, multiplying and amplifying their money. Uh, under my episcopate, this commitment will bring in $3.5 million in gratitude to the Great Commission Fund. The next gift is the Reverend David Franklin Taylor Endowed Scholarship at Seminary of the Southwest. We felt like it was important not only to support the ongoing efforts of the Pauli Murray Scholarship, but to set aside $1.5 million by the Bishop Quinn Foundation uh, to support the academic scholarships at our Seminary of the Southwest. Reverend David Franklin Taylor uh, was uh, the first priest of color raised up by historic black churches in the Diocese of Texas. In 1904, Bishop Consolving licensed him as a lay reader uh, at St. John the Baptist Chapel in Tyler. He was ordained in 1906 and served as deacon in charge. And then after or being ordained priest, he was sent to St. Augustine's in Galveston. We thought it was fitting to honor his memory and legacy 
as the first uh, priest raised up. The last piece of the initiative is the Dr. Bertha Sadler Means Endowment for Racial Justice at Seminary of the Southwest. This is a $3 million grant from the Bishop Quinn Foundation. Dr. Bertha Sadler Means is a founding member of St. James Austin, though she was very young at the time, a community leader, political advocate, activist, businesswoman, inspirational trailblazer, a 1945 graduate of Tillotson College, earned her master's degree in education from the University of Texas, a long career in education before retiring from Austin Independent School District. She was and is an inspiration to young men and women alike and a recipient of the Charles Atkins African American Heritage Award in 2002. She is known for her exemplary character, leadership, and community service, both in our congregation and outside. This endowment is housed at the Seminary of the Southwest and seeks to fund in perpetuity a ministry to support visiting black scholars, research in Texas slavery and racism, teaching racial justice, formation for empowerment of black leaders, encouragement for Episcopal black ministries, and the Diocese of Texas and the wider church. The Episcopal Foundation of Texas is committed to a follow-up gift to the Seminary of the Southwest outside of its initial racial justice gift, ongoing annual support, and capital campaign support. They hope that they will, in 2022, be invited to make another million dollar gift to support this developing ministry in the Diocese of Texas. So if you look then at this next slide, you'll see that the Diocese of Texas is setting aside $13 million over the next decade to do the work of racial justice. Um, I am grateful. <laughs> I am grateful to our foundations, for the early adopters in our congregations, for seeing a transformational tipping point moment for us. I have gotten nothing but support for doing this work. People are desperate for positive action on this. Desperate. And it is our work as the Diocese of Texas to step forward as a leader. We have always done this. Step forward as a leader and example to invite others to follow. They imagined with me the potential that we have to make a positive impact and a hopeful healing impact on the issues of race within our diocese that will affect us and the wider community of Texas. You're being uh, handed out at this time a special message that was given uh, to you uh, from Presiding Bishop Michael Curry uh, as he has been praying for us in the last three days as we approach this announcement. I'm grateful for my friends across the diocese, especially in the historic black churches who have taught me so much and have been patient friends. I'm proud to walk this walk with all of you, and I'm grateful for your honesty, your vulnerability, and courage in entrusting me to lead our common work. I'm grateful to my friend bishops who have been conversation partners, and I'm grateful to the presiding bishop's kind words and support of me, but also of you. We, uh, I want to draw all of this to a close with a bit of theology. If you look at the Grunwald triptych here, which should be the next slide, it is one of the most amazing, grotesque, morbid, and even macabre crucifixion paintings from the Middle Ages. It's called the Grunwald Triptych or Eisenheim Altarpiece. It was painted by Matthias Grunwald for the monks of St. Anthony 
who served in the Eisenheim Hospital. They devoted themselves to the poorest of the poor in the most desperate cases of epidemic cruelty in the Middle Ages. The truth is, it's horrible to look at, but the art is not meant for the healthy. It is meant for the diseased, the pockmarked, those with sores, and the dying. The art has the purpose of mirroring for the viewer in Christ's suffering their own suffering. Christ literally in the art takes on the suffering of the patients at the hospital. It is a means to say to a patient, Christ's body is with you, Christ's body is for you. It is a dynamic, powerful, and moving work of art in its context. One art historian wrote the emphatic physical suffering was intended to be thaumaturgic. There's your big word for the day, thaumaturgic. In other words, the work of art is meant to be miracle performing. The church is a kind of thaumaturgic work of art. It is to be miracle performing. A sacramental vessel, it is a vision to the world of Christ's body. You see, the church is not the sum of people who call themselves Christian, but the very body of Christ reflecting the woundedness, pain, suffering of the world. The church is the sum of people who, like Christ, do the things that Christ does, especially as it sacrifices itself in service to its community. The church is the corporate life that appears indivisible from the body of Christ and from God. And so rather than presenting ourselves as church, the church presents itself as Christ's body to the world. So that when people look upon the church as the patients so long ago looked upon the suffering Christ in the hospital in Eisenheim, when people look upon the church, they must see themselves and their own suffering in the body as well as their deliverance and their own resurrection. The church, you see, is a kind of work of art at once, an icon of God for people. It is also everywhere and always at its best when it lives with the people and reflects their own suffering, pains, and sores. This is the work that we are given to do in our time and in our context. And as your bishop, as your friend, as your fellow baptized Christian, I could not imagine a better group of people with whom to do this work. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.